Okay, welcome to thermodynamics. Um, we kind of there's a, there's a chapter six, a bunch of notes, but we kind of they kind of folded into so anyway. Chapter six is gone. You can look at the notes if you want. There's no homework. It's a bunch of stuff we kind of covered um, uh, along the way. Um, like I think it was conservation of energy and stuff. It seems like it's all folded in. So anyway, moving right along into uh, the second law of thermodynamics. This is where we talk about entropy and where that comes from. So um, to me, uh, all the definitions they have for the second law are Funky. Uh, first, we, we have to start with defining uh, high temperature reservoir, low temperature reservoir. Um, in these, this concept, we have something that's a constant, that a constant temperature such that you can suck energy out of it and it stays at the same temperature. We call it a reservoir because it, it, you can say it's like a, it always has that <coughs> temperature source. Your water heater, an electric water heater at home, is not one of those reservoirs because it doesn't recharge as fast as you discharge it. And if you take a long enough shower, the water gets cold, right? Yeah. So a heat sink would be an example of a low temperature source like a computer. Yeah. Um, low temperature source, but not a reservoir because the heat sink can warm up if you stay long enough. Um, it's if it's safe at a constant low temperature, the lowest constant temperature, then a, you know, a reservoir is like so much thermal mass that your load will not change it. Um, your load is very small compared to its reservoir. So we have a, a source, high temperature reservoir, a sink, and that's literally heat sink is what they call it. It's like water going down the drain, it's energy going into the air, and the heat sink is one of those things. Um, so this thing, large enough capacity, the temperature doesn't change due to your load. Um, and a heat engine is what thermodynamics is all about. A heat engine is something that converts heat into work. Gasoline, we convert gasoline into heat, and then the heat is converted into work in the combustion process. Um, so Car engine is one, uh, power plant, steam power plant, uh, turbojet, this would be, could be auto cycle or diesel cycle, this could be uh, Rankin cycle, this would be uh, Brazen cycle, we'll be studying those, what that means, what the different cycles are about. And what isn't a heat engine, electric motor, hydroelectric turbine, those are, um, Converting energy from one form to another, but it's not heat energy into work. <clears throat> it's a uh, different uh, thing. It's still converting things. So um, we have diagrams. And your basic diagram for a heat engine. Um, conceptually, we're going to have a high temperature source, heat comes from that into the engine. It makes some work and it makes some exhaust. And the exhaust goes into a low temperature sink. It is true that if, um, some of the nuclear plant failures that happen. Um, Three Mile Island, or Nine Mile Island, or Seven, whatever the heck Mile Island thing that was in Pennsylvania. <laughs> it was a problem. The, the, low, the, the um, Some pumps failed, and the low temperature side started to gain uh, on it, and then that was less mm -hmm. power from the turbine. Turbine less, was demanding less from the reaction reactor didn't shut down and overheated. Um, so there's times when this isn't. I like a low temperature sink like that. But, you know, this is what we paid for, the heat in. 
this is what we got. And the this divided by that tells us the efficiency of this thing. We're going to draw a circle around it. And that circle, uh, we don't, it's, that circle is all, all of that stuff. <coughs> There's a bunch of stuff inside of it, but we, when we're looking at, sometimes when we're looking, we're looking at a big enough a view of it system view, instead of looking at how many parts are there that are doing all the work, we just draw a big box around it and say, in this building, this big box, stuff goes in and stuff comes out, and we just look at, we don't worry about what goes on inside the box. So in the system view, this would be a system view of, an, of a um, heat engine. This is, oh, it's got to have a condenser, it needs a pump, it needs a turbine, it needs a boiler, what have you. So, um, all of them, what's common is they, we're going to, the way we look at them, we're going to receive energy from a high temperature source. Well, if it's your gasoline engine, that's not the gasoline, it's the, the after the gasoline burns, that's the high temperature source. Um, and then it converts part of that to uh, <coughs> To work, and what's left goes out to the is the exhaust going to the low temperature sink. Um, and this is crucial; they operate on a cycle of processing, and those processes repeat. And <coughs> that's what the cycle is about. Processes tell you how you go from one state to another, and they link at particular states. So you're walking from state to state by you know, a very process, which, you know, the process would be constant pressure, constant temperature, constant volume, or no heat flow, which would be adiabatic, insulated. And special case of that is isentropic, which is sort of what we're, why we're here in this chapter. Um, so it makes some work. But it takes work to keep it going. What's that? Um, in, a, a new, in a steam power plant, uh, you have to have a pump that generates the pressure. Um, so <coughs> if um, that's consuming work, so the, the difference between what the output is and what that input is, that's the network being done because basically you have to turn the pump with some power. It may come off the shaft of the turbine. It may be making a certain amount of power, but not all that power is getting to the generator. Some of it's going to the pump. Or some of the output from the generator is wrapping around and going to the pump. And net effect is you got to add some stuff. In your car, you got to turn an alternator, you got to turn a water pump, you got to turn the fan. Uh, you know, those are all loads that you're having to put back into uh, the system. So the net output, that's what matters. There's the engine itself puts out a certain amount of work, and then there's stuff you have to put back into it to keep it going. And what we care about is the net difference. And there's going to be an energy balance on it all. That's the first law of thermodynamics. Um, energy in <laughs> equals energy out plus some difference in energy within the system. That's energy when you start your car in the morning. Uh, it's cold. And the exhaust pipe isn't going to be putting out the same temperature until it all comes up to a standard temperature. Uh, when, when it comes up to, to steady state, uh, that Delta goes to zero, and then what comes in equals what goes out. Now, what's coming out, part of it might be work, and part of it might be exhaust. But um, so on heat engines, the energy in is the Q in, uh, energy out is the network, and then the exhaust, the exhaust heat. It's not necessarily exhaust. Um, in a power plant, you'd have exhaust that's going out the boiler stack that's hot. 
that's you know wasted energy, and you also have heat coming out the condenser when you're condensing the water. In your car, it's going out the exhaust and it's also coming out the radiator. It turns out the radiator and the exhaust are about as much energy coming out of each one of those. If you don't have the radiator, your car overheats and it melts, or something in the engine uh, freezes up or whatever. Um, so when you have steady state, this delta energy that's a warming up, <clears throat> steady state means you're going down the freeway and you're going 60 miles an hour and you've been doing it for half an hour. All the temperatures are going to be stable at, at any one point. Uh, put a thermocouple on any part of the engine and it's going to read the same thing. So it's it's uh, that's your steady state. Um, and that's mostly that's mostly we were only going to study steady state. We're not going to study what happens when the, the warm up and the cool down. That's really important for uh, engine emissions. You know, they give you 30 seconds to come in with an emission specs. Well, that's that's the hardest part of designing an engine is making that that work these days. Um, so anyway, we've got Q in. This is your exhaust. That's your fuel, and this is what the work that gets done. So we got an energy balance. Um, if you have 100 kilojoules coming in, and the work output you get is 20 kilojoules, then you got 20. It cost you 100, so you have 20%. Uh, uh, efficiency and your waste heat's this much. If you know any, any two of these things, you can figure out the rest. If you think about it, because this is defined as this divided by that. So if you know this and you know this, you can come up with that. If you know that and this, you can come up with that. All you need is two of these characteristics and you can un unbundle all of those things. Um, uh, the performance, again, what did you get? Divided by what did it cost you? Uh, you got energy balance and so forth. Um, this box drives me crazy. Um, this is supposed to be the, the you know, neo Greek letter for efficiency. Um, so, for most thermal engines, th uh, heat engines, if you get 40% efficiency, be very, very happy. I mean, that's, that's uh, you know, I think, uh, a, for instance, a gasoline engine um, efficiencies, Typical efficiencies are about um, maximum typical efficiency is about 25%. For a diesel, it's about 35%. For a super huge uh, steam power plant, it's uh, they got it up to like 42, maybe 45, might be setting the records these days. Yeah, Andrew? Would a two stroke be more or less than a four stroke gasoline? Uh, two strokes likely to be less efficient because the, all the scavenging going on, it's, it's not, um, you're, you're losing some fuel. But uh, what two strokes are is more energy dense. So that's why chainsaws are not like four stroke diesel engines because you couldn't lift it. So. But they're, they're a lot of power for the space. Because I know two-stroke motorcycles are usually more powerful than the four-stroke, but they're less efficient. Yeah, and that's that's uh, yeah, that I think that's that's basically the way it should go. Is because you can't optimize as well. You're you're optimizing for power. Every power every stroke is a power stroke, and the whole stroke is a power stroke because you got to do some stuff with the exhaust and with the, the intake. So. Uh, and a lot of times, part of the problem is it blows fuel through, unless you can direct inject or something. There's two-stroke diesel engines. In fact, that's uh, I'm told that uh, 
uh, locomotives are two-stroke diesel, which is like crazy to think about. Because you don't think of a two-stroke engine, you think of two-stroke engine just a silly high burn going 10,000 rpm. Uh, the diesel on the locomotive just going boom, and uh, making a huge amount of power. So, uh, uh, yeah, I was just reading up on that uh, recently. So, um, an actual car engine at peak efficiency for gasoline engine, maybe you get 25%, but when you actually, that's running steady state at maximum condition, um, not maximum power, but maximum efficiency condition. If you actually put it in your car and you do the numbers, it ends up being about 15% efficient to the, to the uh, on average, to the, like, to the transmission, and then, let's see, yeah, to the wheels, and then out of that, about a third of that is lost to the uh, air friction and about a third of that is lost to rolling resistance of deforming your tires at 60 miles an hour and you end up with overall about 5% efficiency for actually moving the car down the road. And that's that's why hybrids, the thing about hybrids is you can recapture your braking because part of, and, and then, then that last 5% is, is, uh, is lost in your brakes. When you slow them, you know, 5% gets you going and then you put it back in the brakes. What the hybrids are basically there to capture regenerative braking. And so uh, by capturing that 5%, you can, can make the 95% uh, you recapture 10 times quicker. So, um, so let's, let's do one here. How much am I going to do? Here we got the heat engine. And high temperature source, we know we have a Q dot of 80 megawatts. <coughs> Oh, yep, yep. Oh, boy. There we go. And we don't know what kind of heat engine it is. It doesn't really matter at this point. Um, And if we knew, if we measured mass flow rate and the temperature and all that, we figured out this is how much energy was, was coming out of the boiler or the fuel or what have you. And we measured the exhaust and the, the flow there, and we figured out this is how much energy is coming out. Something's missing. If this is in steady state, then we figure out how much is work. Yeah, it's down here 30. So the work net equals Q in minus Q out. And since this is about power, it's the little dots, how fast it's going, which is 80 minus 50 <coughs> equals 30. That's a good exam question. You like that one? You'll probably see one like it. Seriously, there will be the next test will have one just it's about like conversion and about this about this hard, maybe a little harder. Actually, it will be a little bit harder because um, because I'll probably ask the question. I'll say this has a certain amount of efficiency and it has this out. So now what are these other things and um, So, if that's the case, what's our system efficiency? Yeah. 
Well, it's what did we get? We got the net work. What did it cost us? Q in. Thirty over eighty. Yep, thirty over eighty. And don't anyone get out a calculator. Does anyone know what thirty over eighty is? Three eight. Oh, oh. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. Almost 38% efficient, that's what that means. 30. Yeah, okay. so point, point 0.375. You know, all the percent means is per 100. Okay. So if you divide that by 100, you got percent. So let's do another one. Now we're going to crank it up a little bit. We have a uh, engine, a car engine, that's putting out that much power. <laughs> that might not be apparent, but can we come up with miles per gallon on this? We're going to probably we're gonna end up with, we have to make a few assumptions, but we have a 65 horsepower car engine. The efficiency is 24%. So my network is 65 horsepower. Um, efficiency of the system is 24% or 0.24. I'm using fuel with a value of 19,000 BTUs per pound mass. I need to find the fuel consumption rate. and exhaust energy. So here's my engine. I don't know if it's, what kind of engine it is. Might be diesel, might be steam engine, who knows. Steampunk, you know. <coughs> By the way, if it was just work, it would be in kilojoules or BTUs or foot pounds. If it's power, it's that much per second, it'd be kilowatts, kilojoules per second, BTUs per hour, what have you. So, um, this is 65 horsepower. Let's see, my efficiency is. Can you move uh, it up? Yeah, Work net divided by heat in. I know these two things. I want to find Q in. So I'm going to solve for Q in. And Q in is going to be um, Q dot is work net divided by efficiency, which is. 65 horsepower divided by 0.24. And it's going to give me a bunch of horsepower. 271. We really only have two digits, but I'm going to stick with the three. And when I'm all done, then I'll know that I have to go back to two. So, that's my Q in, and I can write that up 
above, and we can actually answer one of our questions already. Is it possible to figure out what our exhaust energy is? Maybe we take 271 and divide or subtract 65 from it. And just off the top of my head, I'd say that's going to be 206. Mm -hmm. What fraction is that of, of the 271? Yeah, if 24% went that way, the rest of it's going out, so it's going to be the, the rest. 1 minus 0.24, so it's 76%. So I'll just, that was one of the things you want to know. So Q out is 271 minus 65 equals 206 horsepower. And now I want to know the fuel rate. Um, so I have to come up with. The fuel coming in is 271 horsepower worth of fuel. <clears throat> Do you buy fuel by the horsepower? <laughs> yeah, fill her up. Give me about, oh no, I only give me 10 horsepower worth. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a rate, but, but you know, a horsepower is. We're going to come up with like BTUs per hour. Yeah, there's a bunch of different ways we can do horsepower. Let's see if I got one I like. Oh, yeah, they do have one. Um, one horsepower. Oops. One horsepower is so many BTUs. Um, there's so many foot pounds. Per sec 550 foot pounds per second is the definition for horsepower. And a foot pound can be defined in terms of BTUs. And they already did it for us in the front of your book under power. Uh, one horsepower, one of the definitions is 42.41 BTUs per minute. And, you know, again, power was energy per unit time, and now this is. BTUs per minute, energy per unit time. So cancel H P. And a horsepower is canceling. We've got BTUs per minute, but I want to know about fuel. So what do we know about the fuel? And I know that one pound mass we we're given was 19,000 BTUs. That's rewriting fuel energy of 19,000 BTUs per pound, which is the same as saying one pound. Has 19,000 BTUs, and I just turned it around, and now I can say I have that many pounds per minute. So. Uh, What do we get? 19,000. Oh, I cannot do that one in my head. 0. 0.605 pounds mass per minute. And just for grins, let's let's turn it into pounds per hour. So I got 60 minutes is one hour. Oops. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so we got what, 36 and something? 36.3. Again, we only had two digits to start with, and um, we should only be dealing with two digits, but I'm, I'm not completely done. If we knew this was in a truck going down the highway, could we turn this into miles per gallon? If we make an assumption, the, the truck's going 60 miles an hour. So miles per gallon is um, 
60 miles per hour. Divide that by um, thirty six point three pounds per hour. Now we've got miles per pound, but I need the density of gasoline. I happen to know I'm gonna make a guess here, but virtually all petroleum is around a specific gravity of 0.8, so that's uh, there's eight. <coughs> that means that uh, a gallon of water would be about eight pounds, and if it's 0.8 times that, you'd have like eight times 0.8. It's going, they're going to be around. I'm going to say 6.4 pounds mass per. Oh, that's wrong. One gallon. I got a raw number for. So we got one gallon is. We'll say it's like six, six point four pounds mass. Just I know the specific gravity is about 0.8. It floats, and it's around there's like seven point seven six to point eight two or something like that. So pound mass cancels, hours cancel. We end up with. I'll speed it up a little bit. Yep. MPG. 10.5 miles per gallon. 10.5. It's probably a semi. <laughs> it's going 60 miles an hour, or or just a big truck. Um, but oh, actually, that the, if the efficiency on it's not quite right. You know, your car driving down the road, you get a car and you're like, oh, you know, I got a car, it's got, sorry, you know, 350 horsepower. Wow, yeah. That engine probably never saw 350 horsepower unless you were in a drag strip, and then it only saw it for 10 seconds. <laughs> um, you know, going down the road, you don't need that much power. Um, and this. Says you. Says you. This, well, you know, I was I was telling you about the like the overall efficiency thing. It's like about a five percent kind of number, and we said twenty five. In reality, if we had a, a a proper efficiency number on that, this would be a one fifth the efficiency. It would be uh, one fifth the mileage. You'd be getting more like two miles per gallon in the real world, maybe four. Semis. Anyone know how much semis get? Yeah, it's about six to eight. Wow. That's wow. that's what the and the other thing I learned yeah. recently, you think that really big truck, really big engine, it must have about a thousand cylinders, right? I mean if if a Viper can have what twelve or sixty, whatever whatever Viper's ten, V ten. Semi must have like forty four cylinders, don't you think? <laughs> six. <laughs> Fifteen liters. And, and six uh, they cylinders. They got, and they don't turn very fast. Because the bigger stuff gets, the slower it goes, just because of the amount of mass, and and the faster something spins around, the bigger it is. The more centrifugal force wants to make it explode. So there's there's how this this sort of thing works. We can get to unexpected results from really basic stuff. We didn't talk. Anything about how the engine worked, we just came up with a, a, a value for what inside that box it was 24% efficient. Now there's a different bunch of engineers that were working on how to make that box into 24% efficient. But there's sort of the system view, which is larger view, and then the smaller view. How do you make it more efficient? Uh, later on, that's that's where we're going with all this. How do how do we make it more efficient? What are the things that matter? So, you might not think of it as a heat engine, but the um, refrigerator is a heat engine. It's just pumping heat from one place to another. And the work that it gets, you put work into it, it's a backwards heat engine. It takes, you put work into it, and it takes 
something out of a cold zone and pushes it into a high zone. And it takes the amount of, if you put in 100 watts worth of energy, it might take 300 watts worth of stuff out of the cold zone and into the hot zone it puts 400 watts. It still balances. Um, how many people know about heat pumps? A heat pump is a refrigerator, only you're trying to refrigerate the grate out of doors. And how's that work? You, 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 it, it, you take an air conditioner and you reverse it. You could do the same thing with the one in the, the ones that go in like in the window. Just put it in the window backwards, and then you, the only problem is you have to go outside to do all the controls. <laughs> but it takes it tries to chill the outdoors, right? And then all the waste heat goes inside. What's it do? It pumps heat from low temperature outdoors when it's freezing outdoors, and jacks it up to a higher temperature and takes all that energy and multiplies it. So a heat pump can generate three times as much energy as a baseboard heater. Um, oh, so. Like, for example, I do have two of those in my house. Heat so pump? when winter, no, oh. just regular AC windows. Yeah. So you're telling me for the, when the windows comes for me to flip them and then I return the heat on and I use that set? Yeah, except they aren't optimized for that, so you'll have other problems. Like your wife will want you to go out and turn up the heat and you have to put on your everything and go out in the snow and, and turn up the air conditioning to try and, like, get hotter. Yeah. Or, They'll optimize for them. But they, they seriously... Right, they could if, work. If, yeah. Okay. And, in fact... Uh, if you'll see the, the air conditioning units, and if a house has an air conditioning unit, all they have to do is put in a reversing valve, and in the summer, it air conditions the inside of the house, and the cold side goes to the inside. Huh. In the winter, you know that. they swap huh. the, all the, the compressors all outside. They just swap the uh, which heat exchangers which, and Literally, and we'll, I'll bring that up. We have an example of that we'll, we'll bring up here. Um, they just swap the air condition, the, the, the heat exchangers, and now the hot ones inside and the cold ones outside in the cold weather. Uh, they even use this places like Norway, which gets really cold in the winter, but they'll do what they call ground source uh, heat pump, where instead of cooling the air, um, they will take the um, Yeah, they're basically trying to cool the ground. They're trying to get the heat out of the ground. And below like 18 inches, the ground temperature is going to be like 55 degrees all the time. And it's a heat sink. It's a thermal reservoir. So it might be 20 below zero up above. And you can take these coils of, you know, glycol water, whatever, and bury them down six feet. And it'll try and freeze the ground underneath. But the, there's, there's heat in the, you know, it, it just... You, it's, it's a thermal reservoir. Yeah. Is that kind of probably the same basis behind like my parents' basement? It's pretty deep down into their house in Yakima, and every time in winter or summer, every time down there, it's like 60 degrees flat. Yes. It's always about 55, 60 degrees. So that's the whole cellar thing. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why don't we use more ground source heat pumps? They're like ridiculously efficient. Uh, because. because I tried to put one in. The dis installers, it's it's a real pain in the butt to, if there's something wrong with it, to dig it up or excavating, excavating it, and a mole goes in. They're, they're, they just take PEX tubing and go out here, see your project. Um, um, so it's it's uh, it's one of those things that's a really good engineering idea for people that are doing it, but uh, reliability wise, uh, and the, the uh, People are still used to what they've been doing all along, where they just take something out of a box, plop it on the ground, and hook it up, as opposed to having to dig the hole and come up with, deal with uh, uh, ordering a backhoe, and then they're not really comfortable with, with the whole water side of it, because it, it tends to be a, instead of air, it's, it's water that they're pumping through there. Uh, it's more complicated, it costs more money to put them in. I was thinking more industrial, not a Oh. I, it's probably the scale of, of the complexity and the extra cost. When the price of energy goes up, then stuff like that starts to happen more.
So, uh, yeah, that's the refrigeration thing. It's another kind of heat engine on the factor. You put the work in, it takes some out of here, and it adds them together. It's still adding up. If you, if this is what you're using, then um, you know you multiplied it, and and this multiplier, it's not an efficiency thing. Uh, they call it coefficient performance because it's bigger than one, and it can be two or three or four or five depending on condition. Um, yeah. And we will, that'll be like, our last chapter will be focusing on that more. But uh, basically, in a refrigeration system, you have a compressor, takes uh, saturated vapor, maybe superheated vapor that's cold and evaporated at the low pressure, pressurizes it into high pressure, and then the condenser, and you, you compress it to a pressure that, such that the saturation temperature is above the ambient temperature, and then the ambient temperature tries to cool it down, and it condenses. Uh, so it's all about making sure that your compressor, your, your high side pressure is above saturation temperature is for whatever your refrigerant you're using. Usually it's all for above uh, room temperature. Um, so in the condenser, you have a high temperature and high pressure, and then it condenses. This is the hot side now, uh, and it comes into liquid, and it gives off the latent heat. And then the liquid goes to an expansion valve, and the expansion valve literally just sprays it into the low, low zone, and it may have some controls on how much it sprays. And all Are we going to play with the refrigeration system at all? Um, we'll have one, we'll turn it on, we're not going to analyze it. Okay. And meter, meters the refrigerant through there, sprays it in there, it comes as a fog, which would have some quality, and then it sort of superheats in the cold zone because it's a low enough pressure, the saturation is low, and uh, as, it, as the fog evaporates, it absorbs. Uh, energy at that low temperature. So uh, it's it's a heat thing. Instead of a you have a compressor instead of a uh, turbine or whatever, it's just an expansion valve. And sprays it in there. Big enough system, you might actually have a turbine in here and recapture some energy, but I haven't heard of that being done. Uh, so instead of efficiency, we call it coefficient performance, but it's the same thing. It's just what did you get divided by what did it cost you? In this case, what you got is bigger than what it cost you. So we don't call it efficiency, but it's the same thing. Um, Interesting thing on a heat pump, um, because the heat flow on the high side is bigger than the heat flow on the low side. Um, if you think about it and do the numbers, what you discover is the coefficient of performance for a heat pump is actually bigger than the coefficient of performance for the refrigerator, because this part is means you're also adding. Uh, the, the heat flow here includes the heat flow from the work you put into it. So it's whatever refrigerator is, and that could be two, three, or four times as much. But if, if this coefficient of refrigerator was, was, or an air conditioning unit was three, then as a heat pump, it would be four. Because the work you put into it is going into the high zone. So, um, you know, I think I'll uh, let this one ride till next time. We'll do the example. So, see you. Yeah.